Even when we don't see him working, he's working. How many has ever had God do exactly what that song is talking about? Taking something that you knew the devil meant to cause you harm. And by the time God got done working with that, it was something good. Isn't it amazing how the Lord works? Amen. I'm so thankful for God's mercy and his love. Also glad to have my buddy Ryan sitting right up here on the front row. Man, he was here for Sunday school today. Sister Wendy's grandson, we love him. Amen. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 29, verse number 18. Proverbs 29 and 18. And I believe the Lord has something for us this morning. I'd ask you and encourage you to just open your heart to the teaching, preaching of the Word of God. And let's leave here this first Sunday of May. Let's leave here having received something from the Lord. Amen. This might be the service for a certain person in this building where it just clicks. Maybe you've been struggling. Maybe you've been worried. Maybe you've had a lot of anxiety and fear and, and stress about what's going to happen in your life. This might be the service where it just clicks and you realize God's got it under control. Amen. Proverbs 29, 18. I did not know that that song specifically was going to be sung right here before I preached. And um, I'm sure they sent me the list. They did. I know they did. But, uh, of course, sometimes I review that and I'm in a hurry and just make sure that they're all good songs. But I believe that that fits exactly with what my message is going to be here. So we're in the will of God here this morning. Proverbs 29, 18. If you have it, say praise the Lord. And I want us to read it out loud together. It's not a long verse. Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Where there is no vision, the people perish. I want to preach to you this morning the ability to see beyond. The ability to see beyond. Say beyond what, Pastor? Beyond today. Beyond your issue, beyond your trial, beyond your dark time, the ability to see beyond. Let's pray before we're seated. Father, open our hearts to the preaching of the Word of God. Thank you for the anointed singing, the anointed music, the anointed fellowship, the wonderful Sunday school hour that our kids had, our adults had. We're just looking forward to your Word helping someone this morning. Open our minds and hearts to the preaching of your Word. Let us leave here better than the way that we came. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Where there is no vision, the people perish. That's a very strong statement for Solomon to make. Think about that for just a moment. When there's not a vision for the people, everybody dies. Who's responsible for the vision? Who's responsible to come up with the vision? Why is it that innocent people suffer where there is no vision? Maybe there was a vision and they didn't receive the vision. There's a lot to unpack in that verse. But Solomon simply says, without getting into all the nuances of it, without a vision, somebody dies. I began to look into this passage of Scripture, and my heart turned to Isaiah 22. And I want to turn there with you if you have your Bibles, and I want to read two verses out of Isaiah chapter 22. These are unique verses, not some that you hear talked about very often, not because they're uh, less important, but simply perhaps not in the context of which I'm bringing them to you this morning. Isaiah 22, 1. Isaiah the prophet said, the burden of the valley of vision. What aileth thee now that thou art wholly gone up to the housetops? Skip down to verse 5. For it is a day of trouble and of treading down and of perplexity by the Lord God of hosts in the valley of vision. Breaking down the walls and of crying to the mountains. Now this is a particular point in history 
in Israel and in, in, in the Jews' history when they were invaded by the Persians and the prophet Isaiah was prodding them a little bit and he was saying, I know it's difficult to have a vision in these dark times. He calls it in verse 1, the valley of vision. He even says there's a burden in having a vision in the valley of visions. It's not easy in the midst of heartache and trial to lift up your head and try to see past the present moment. It's not easy when you're going through hell to see heaven. It's not easy when your eyes are wet with tears to smile in anticipation of the joy that is to come. And Isaiah pinpoints the paradox this morning of vision. He says it's a valley. It's tough when you're in that time of your life. But even in that moment when you're in that valley, you've got to have a vision. Because as Solomon says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Along with that, in Job chapter 7 and verse number 14, another unique statement about this idea of having a vision, this concept of of having a vision. Job, of course, who saw in the midst of his turmoil, he was able to keep his head screwed on right. He was able to see through the darkness and realize that I don't really know what God is doing, but God is doing something here. And the end result is that he got more in the latter part of his life than at the beginning part of his life. We're not here to talk about Job today, but we could. And Job's life is a beautiful example of having a vision in a dark time. But notice what Job 7 and 14 says. Then thou scarest me with dreams and terrifiest me through visions. So Isaiah says, in the middle of the valley, we still have to have a vision. Job comes along and says, God, I, I don't even really know if I want to see the vision that you're about to show me because it terrifies me. You scare me with dreams. You terrify me with visions. But even on top of all that, we still hear Solomon say, where there is no vision, the people perish. Sometimes, folks, you've got to be able to look through the battle and see a glimpse of what God is going to do in the future. It might be tough. It might be hard. It might terrify you, as Job said. It might scare the daylights out of you. Like Job said, like Isaiah said, it might be in the battle and you're ailing and you're going through it. But Solomon is very clear. If you don't do that, you will not make it. In Spain... There's a mountain that rises from the bottom of the ocean 1,500 feet above the surface of the water. It's called the Rock of Gibraltar. Only a little more than 550 years ago, remember, 550 years in history is a short time. The Spanish government carved in the face of that rock three words. Ne plus ultra. Ne plus plus ultra. And they did this to protect people from falling off what they considered to be a flat earth. This carving in this rock meant stop. Don't go any further. There is nothing past this point. Ne plus ultra. When Columbus discovered that the world did not stop at the Rock of Gibraltar. Spain removed the first word, nay. They scratched it out. And all that's left on the rock today is plus ultra, which means there is something beyond. Who was that first person that got in their boat that morning and said, we're going to sail past the point? That we've been told we can never go. If we die, we die. If we fall off the flat earth, 
so be it. Who was that brave person that that morning kissed their wife and children goodbye and got on top of that boat and set sail and pulled up the anchor and everybody waved as they sailed off in the horizon. Can you imagine the palpitation of their heart as they got up to the point of the rock of Gibraltar and kept sailing and sailed on and sailed on. Folks, I'm telling you, where there is no vision, the people perish. Somebody this morning needs to hear what this preacher is saying. There is going to be a brighter day. There is going to be a tomorrow. There is going to be a bright future for you and your family. God's got something wonderful that you can't even imagine. Sail on. Sail on past the point that you were told you could never go. You see, vision recognizing something exists beyond where you stand. Vision is that ability to see beyond. I would remind God's people this morning that we are people of faith. I don't mean just that we keep the faith, but we are people of lowercase F-A-I-T-H. And Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Verse 6, Without faith it is impossible to please God. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I want to tell this church, you're not going to get very far in your walk with God without faith. And I don't mean just, Lord, I have faith you can heal the sick. Lord, I have faith you're going to help my finances. Lord, I have faith you're going to bless my marriage. Lord, I have faith you're going to give us revival. I mean faith that comes in the darkness of night when you look up in the middle of total blackness and say, I know there's light somewhere. I don't see it, but I know it's there. I'm talking about faith that causes you to grab a hold of your miracle and say, in the name of Jesus, it shall be well. It shall be. I'm talking about faith that that little woman, the Shunammite woman said, my son shall live when he was already dead. That's the kind of faith I'm talking about. Faith. Faith that sees your family in church. Faith that sees your husband full of the Holy Ghost. Faith that sees your wife full of the Holy Ghost. Faith that sees your sick relative standing and worshiping God faith we are people of faith and it's not just something good that you have to have without faith it is impossible to please God and Solomon said I'm going to do you even better than that where there is no vision the people perish You've got to have faith in your personal walk with God. And the church has to have faith as a corporate body. And we call that vision. Let's go to Numbers 13. Numbers chapter 13. And verse 26. Numbers chapter 13, verse number 26. They went and came to Moses, to Aaron... To all the congregation of the children of Israel, to the wilderness of Paran, to Kadesh, they brought back word unto them, to all the congregation, they showed them the fruit of the land. The setting here is the land of Canaan. The spies went into the land of Canaan. They brought back word and they brought back fruit as exhibit number one. Here's what grows over there. Look at this. Verse 27. They told him and said... We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Children of Anak were the giants. 
And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites. They dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea, and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Stop, 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 stop. Hush, hush, hush. Let us go up at once and possess it. We are well able to overcome it. You see, that's vision. And without a vision, the people perish. I proffer to you this morning that if Caleb had not have said what he said and cut through the darkness with a little beam of light, the children of Israel would have died in the wilderness and would have never stepped up and taken something God already had given them. But Caleb, somewhere in his spirit, he saw something that nobody else saw. He had a vision. The men that went up with him said, verse 31, We are not able to go up against the people. They are stronger than we. They brought up an evil report. Everybody say evil. They brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof and all the people. And we saw the, it, it, men that are of great stature. We saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so were we in their sight. You see, 12 spies went into the land of Canaan. Ten of them came back with a negative report. That's how we've always heard it. But the Bible doesn't use the word negative. The Bible uses the word evil. And I will tell you, those of you that like words and the study of words, evil is one letter away from devil. An evil report. Numbers 13, 32. Ten of them said, we can't do it. And God said, that's of the devil. I've already told you you can have it. But ten of them said, we can't do it. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb said, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. I know the clouds are dark. I know it doesn't look possible. But I see just a little tiny glimmer of light. I think we can do it. Look in verse 27. All 12 spies agreed that the land flowed with milk and honey. I want you to begin to think about this story a little bit differently because we've always kind of understood it that 12 spies went in, 10 of them came back and were negative and evil. Two of them said, yeah, we can do it. But really, that's not exactly how it happened. All 12 spies in verse 27, all of them unanimously said, the land flows with milk and honey. Even the evil reporters said, we acknowledge this land is bountiful and fruitful. Milk and honey is significant because the Jews had been slaves for 400 years in Egypt and they had been deprived of honey, which is anything sweet, and they had been deprived of milk, which is anything calcium, for 10 generations. Anything from the cow was considered sacred. That's why one of the ten plagues, God allowed all the cattle to die. The pollinization process is sacred. Amen? The Jews worshipped this whole pollinization process. And so the milk and honey were sacred. Anything sweet. Think about this. The uh, white cane sugar that we all think about when we think of sugar to put in our coffee or put in our food. That was discovered by the Dutch from the Caribbean. They did not have white cane sugar in Egypt. If they wanted to sweeten their food, it was through nature's sugar, which is honey. And it was sacred, and it was expensive, and it was not something they gave to the slaves. Milk, cheese, cream, anything from the cow was sacred. It was not what they gave to the slaves. Can you imagine growing up in a slave camp? And you hear an old timer talking about what a glass of cold milk tastes like. And you wonder your whole life, I wonder what it would be like to taste just a piece of cheese. I wonder what it would be like to have a spoonful of that stuff they call honey. Grandpa says it is unbelievable. Man, I would love to taste some honey. Can you imagine 
six million people who had never drank a glass of milk, eaten a slice of cheese, or had a tablespoon of honey. And when they come back from Canaan's land, it is important that it is significant that the two descriptions they give of this land, instead of saying things like, man, there's a lot of gold there. Man, we found silver deposits. Man, there's all kind of natural resources. They came back and said, it's flowing with the very things that we've never tasted. I could stop and preach to you this morning just on that, friend. When you come to God, when you come out of Egypt and you come into Canaan's land, whatever it is that you've been deprived of in your past life and, and sin, God's going to give you an overabundance of that. If it's joy that you've never had, it's flowing with joy. If it's peace that you've never had, it's flowing with peace. If it's happiness and contentment, God's house is flowing. Come on, somebody. You know I'm telling you the truth. I'm glad to be in God's house. I'm glad to be a child of God. I'm glad to be serving God. The stuff that Satan used to starve me from, God gives me an overabundance of. Woo, hallelujah. But I digress. That's not my subject this morning. Let me get back to my text. Even the evil spies agreed. The land flowed with milk and honey. But then there was this breakaway. These evil spies agreed the land is flowing with milk and honey. But they still did not believe they could take the land. Listen to me very carefully. When you do not believe the promises of God, the Lord considers this to be evil. Because when you tell God he's a liar, that's what Satan And as I said, evil is one letter from devil. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18. Let me give you a verse to mark in your Bibles in relation to what I just said. Hebrews 6 18, Paul writes, That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. Look at your neighbor and say, God cannot lie. He cannot lie, folks. Now that should be exciting to you because when God says something, you can take that to the bank. Why? Because he cannot lie. He doesn't have the ability to lie. And so when God told the children of Israel, you're going to go take Canaan's land. You're going to drive out the Debussites. You're going to drive out the Hittites. You're going to drive out the Canaanites. You're going to drive out the Amalekites. I'm going to give you all the land. Matter of fact, I'm not going to read it today, but he said, wherever your feet trod, I will give it to you. As long as you keep walking, that's going to be yours. Basically, you stop where you want your border to stop. He gave them a blank check. Write the amount for whatever you want to write it for. It's yours. And Joshua and Caleb got picked with 10 other people to go spy out the land. And 10 of them came back and says, God, you're a liar. We can't take this land. And Caleb said, whoa, 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 whoa. If God said it, it's going to happen. We are more than able to take this land. I want to challenge New Life Tabernacle in 2022. Let's regroup our minds and regroup our heads and regroup our thinking and believe God that on this first day of May for the next seven months for the next eight months we are going to have revival we're bouncing back from COVID we're bouncing back from the storm we went through these next eight months let's see something that God has for us that the devil does not want us to see Let's sense something in the spirit that the devil does not want us to sense. You may not believe it, but there's some people here today that believe there's something out there. God has something for this church. We receive it in Jesus' name. You may be seated. I'm going to unashamedly tell you I've been praying lately that God would help us to get back to 100 on Sundays. We used to run over 100 on Sundays. 
And then we birthed this church and we birthed that church. And then we went through a terrible dark time. And then we went through COVID. And most churches would say, oh, well, you know, I'm just tired of fighting. Let's just come and have church. And you know what's going to happen? Everybody's going to intermarry and intermarry and intermarry. And we're all going to be first, second, third, and fourth cousins. And nobody's going to get the Holy Ghost anymore. Nobody's going to get baptized. And it's all going to be a little social network. I rebuke that foul, evil spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. You hear me? Don't you dare give up on this church. Don't you dare bury this church and say our best day. How dare you? Canaan's land has already been promised. God's just looking for some people that say we are well able to take the land. I know there's giants. I know there's some bad stuff. I know there's some hurdles. But we can do it in Jesus' name. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. You may be seated. Why do you think God gave us this building? Why do you think God gave us 13.29 acres on that corner? Why do you think God gave us a rental house across the street? Why do you think God allowed us to survive through our terrible tragedy? Why do you think we were brought out of Egypt? To die in the wilderness? Why do you think our clothes grew on our back? Why do you think our shoes grew on our feet? Why do you think he allowed manna to fall from heaven? Why do you think he parted the Red Sea? Why do you think quail flew out from, come on somebody. Why do you think water came from a rock? To die in the wilderness? No, no, no. He brought us out of Egypt to take us into a land that he has specifically designed for this church. Our best youth group is ahead of us. Teenagers, do not let it come out of your mouth that, oh, well, we used to have a really good youth group. No, no, no. I rebuke that in Jesus' name. Our best youth group is ahead of us. Our best children's ministry is ahead of us. Our best couples events are ahead of us. What do you say we see people get baptized this year? What do you say we see people get the Holy Ghost this year? What do you see we say, see people get out of a wheelchair this year? What do you say we see people healed and delivered? I want to see more praise testimonies like Brother Benjamin's. I want to see more people coming up and saying, Pastor, my God, y'all prayed for me and my body was healed. I want to see more people saying, I got that job. We got that house. Hey, Grandma's going to get baptized. Mama's going to be in church. I believe it's going to happen in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Sit down for just a moment, please. Let's believe God for people to receive the Holy Ghost, 2022. Let's bind together and believe God for a great harvest in 2022. People just don't want this anymore. That's baloney. People, people just don't want the Holy Ghost no more. Baloney. People don't want to get baptized no more. Baloney. Sliced thick. People just don't want to line up the holiness no more. Baloney. That's an evil report. Amen. Pastor, we just, we just need, come on now, Pastor. You know, we got some good people here. And, and do you really want to bring some of those questionable type people in our church? Oh, yes. Oh. Maybe they'll take your place. God 
please give us some fresh blood. I would rather pastor a sinner who struggles with an addiction, who barely is able to get to church, but when they get there, their hands are in the air and the tears. I would rather pastor them than some dried up, dead, dried in the wool, pharisaical Pentecostal who thinks you're the only person Jesus died for. Hello? I say bring them in. Bring in the drug addict. Bring in the prostitute. Bring in the, 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 the person who's got felonies. Bring in the drunk driver. Bring in the person who spent time in prison. Bring them in. Let God get a hold of their life. Let God put them on the right path. Let God help them become a great saint. Hallelujah. Does anybody want to go to the promised land with me? Woo! Mm. Praise God. Sit down for a moment. I'm not done. We're having a good time. The Holy Ghost is here. When you go to the book of Numbers, I don't have time to read it in detail, but go to the book of Numbers. Joshua and Caleb were the only ones that stood up and said, we can do it. And listen closely. The old crowd said, we cannot. We better listen to the majority of ten. And God said, through his servant Moses, everybody that's over the age, twenty, you will not see Canaan. You will die. Because you want the wilderness more than you want the promised land. Get this. These are the same people. Listen. The same people that in the middle of the wilderness said, Wish to God we were back in Egypt. At least we had leeks and cucumbers and onions. What about the slavery? What about the beatings? What about building Pharaoh's pyramids from the dirt? You see, it was a characteristic flaw. The same people that wished they were in slavery, eating leeks and onions and cucumbers, while they're making bricks for Pharaoh's pyramids, are the same ones that then got used to the wilderness. And we're not ready to shift from slavery to wilderness, from wilderness to Canaan's land. They got stuck right where they were. And now they got used to the manna. And instead of milk and honey, they wanted manna for life. And God said, I can't even deal with that mindset anymore. You're so dangerous to the health of this church. I'm not even going to let you see the next level. I'm going to keep this church right where it's at until that attitude dies out. And then everybody under 20 is going to go with me into Canaan's land. Because the next generation coming up wants what God has for the future. I'm speaking in the Holy Ghost right now to this church. Some of you that are hanging back 10, 15 years ago, you better get on this train, buddy. This train is bound for glory. We're going somewhere. We want you to go with us. We want you to go with us. But if you don't want to go, we're going anyway. This church is going to grow anyway. This church is going to have revival anyway. Does anybody want to go to the promised land with me? Does anybody want to go to Canaan's land with me? Does anybody want to taste a spoonful of honey? Does anybody want a glass of cold milk? Woo! Hallelujah! 
Praise God. Somebody say amen. You may be seated. I do not say that. Please get my spirit. I do not say that in any kind of a facetious manner. I do not say that to be snarky with you. I do not say that to hurt anyone. But I have to tell you, without a vision, the people perish. What is your vision? Just to keep this group because we're safe with that's no vision. Is that your vision? Without a vision, the people perish. Isaiah said, it's a valley of anguish, but you got to look through and see it. Proverbs said, if you don't have it, you're going to die. And Job said, I'm terrified of the stuff that God is showing me. But you know what? Read the last chapter of Job. When he woke up there in the last chapter, he had double everything that he lost. Amen. The only thing God didn't take was his nagging wife. And I think God gave him double kids to make up for his nagging wife. Praise God. Amen. But you know what? The latter latter part of his life was better than the former. What am I telling this church? You've held on. You've held on through the storm. You've held on through COVID. You've held on through our dark times. Better days are coming. Better days are on the way. I see it in the Holy Ghost. I sense it in the Holy Ghost. God's going to honor your faithfulness. God's going to honor your consistency. God's going to honor your loyalty. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You say, well, oh, pastor, I'm, I'm part of the old crowd. Does that mean I'm going to get left behind? No, because Joshua and Caleb were also part of the old crowd. But they saw it. And God said, everybody 20 and over is going to die except Joshua and Caleb. Come on in. And Joshua became the next roar. I could go on and on and on. Brother Marcus, if you'll come to the piano. Let me tell you about Abraham. He looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's in Hebrews chapter 11. You know what, Abraham? It's so interesting that that's what's said about Abraham. Abraham, when you study his life, he lived his entire life living in a tent. Setting up a tent, breaking down a tent. Setting up a tent, breaking down a tent. And Abraham said, if I could put a premium on anything I would like to see in the future, it's a place where there's a foundation. Permanence. No more tent. Stability. He was a visionary. And Abraham begat Isaac. And Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. He had 12 sons who are the 12 tribes of Israel today. And it all started because one old patriarch said, I look for a city which hath foundations. Joseph was a visionary. He envisioned power and influence when he was the only Jew living in Egypt. And God elevated him. When he was in Potiphar's house, he said, I see myself running this place, and it happened. When he was in prison, he said, I see myself having the keys, and it happened. When he was let out of prison, he said, I see myself being the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. You can't do that. You're a Jew. Watch me. And the boy that got sold in slavery went to wearing the ring of Pharaoh and signing off on business deals for food shipments around the world. And I will tell you, if it had not have been for Joseph, we would have had an international famine. But Joseph stored up enough food, not only to feed Egypt, but to also feed other nations at a price, of course. And historians say that's where Egypt got their wealth. Moses envisioned deliverance for the Hebrew people. King David envisioned building a beautiful temple for the Lord God didn't let him build it but King David stored up the money for it he saw it in the eyes of faith even though Solomon is the one that built it David saw it 
Praise God. Some of you that have been coming a long time, you remember me telling years ago in the old building. I'm not talking about this building. I'm not talking about that building. I'm talking about the original building. If we have anybody here from the old building, we've got a couple. Amen. The old building, it was on a Thursday night. We used to have church on Thursday night. I walked up to the pulpit. And all of a sudden, I began to see something in the eyes of the Spirit. People were worshiping. We didn't have a large crowd. There's maybe 15 people there. We had only been there a little bit. And I saw, it's, it seemed to me that it was a while. But when I snapped out of it, I realized they were still singing the same song. So it was just probably 15 seconds or so. But in the Spirit, I saw myself standing on a platform with a house full of people worshiping. People from all races, people from all colors, a young congregation worshiping, praising God. I snapped out of it. And when I lifted my eyes, I actually was a little disappointed because that's not what was there that night. Hello? And I told the church. Some of you remember, I stopped. I said, I just saw something. I don't know what the Lord is showing me, but man, uh, it was exciting. And we moved on with the service. A couple years went by. We bought this property. September of 1999, got the keys. We were actually leasing this property for a year before we bought it in September of 2020. Let me get my facts right. We got the keys, walked into that old building, and I stood on the little tiny platform. The building was empty, no chairs, nothing, just carpet. And when I stood on the platform and lifted my eyes, the Lord said, does this look familiar? And it was the same building I had seen in my vision what was God doing he was given a little home missionary a little glimmer of hope he was given a little home missionary a little glimpse something to happen in the future that gave me the energy to keep going one more Sunday one more week one more week Can I tell you in the eyes of the Spirit today, it would blow your nylon socks off if I told you what God wants to do with this church going forward. You can't even begin to imagine. You can't even begin to understand the beautiful future God has for New Life Tabernacle. But I just need some people to go with me. I just need some people to say, Pastor, we're going to walk with you over into Canaan's land. We believe you. Let's stand together. Peter, Peter, you're just an old dumb fisherman, Peter. But Peter envisioned a society free from racial prejudice. And Peter Probably the roughest out of the bunch is the one that took the gospel to the Gentiles. Paul envisioned preaching the gospel to every nation. I could go on and on and on. I've got a list here of visionaries in the scriptures. But I stop. I feel faith in the house right now. Without a vision, the people perish. I've been here 25 and a half years. If you think for one moment that your pastor is just going to put this thing on cruise, boy, if I can just get to retirement, oh man, if I can just get to retirement, I'm going to say, you got another thing coming, buddy. I'm not looking forward to retirement. I'm looking forward to having revival. Maybe y'all are looking forward to me retiring. I don't know about that because it got weirdly quiet there for just a moment. But I'm looking forward to having revival. I want to see God fill these pew chairs up with people. I want to see us have to build across the street and turn this back into a gym. Oh, yeah. I want to see us have to have two services on Sunday. Oh, would you lift your hands with me right now? Father, we want to have a vision today in the Holy Ghost. We see it through the eyes of the Spirit. We see it through the eyes of faith. We see it in the Holy Ghost this morning. A beautiful future that you have for this church, for every family in this church. God, we've not started our last home missions work. There's going to be more. We've not birthed our last church. There's going to be more. There's going to be more preachers come up out of this church. 
There's going to be more preacher's wives. There's going to be evangelists. There's going to be missionaries. There's going to be young men that you're going to bring up out of this church that are going to blow our minds. There's going to be young ladies you're going to bring out of this church that are going to blow our minds. We've not built our last building. We've not won our last soul. We've not seen our last family come in. We've not seen our last miracle. Greater days are ahead of us. Greater days are in front of us. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We are well able to take the land. You have equipped our church to reach our community. We are not deficit in our truth, Lord. We are not deficit in our power. We are not retarded in our strength and in our ability. You have given us the authority to take this community for the cause of Jesus Christ. And we step into that realm. We step into that realm. If you believe that with me, I'm asking you to come around the front. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Amen. Gather in. Gather in as close as you can. Let's just turn this place into a prayer meeting here these next few moments. I rebuke the spirit of doubt. I rebuke the spirit of fear.